Jones offered her his coat to cover herself with, but for some reason she absolutely refused it. Then I will walk in front of you, and will not offend you by looking back, said Tom. And though he did try to keep looking ahead, the lady often asked him to turn around to help her. And so our hero brought his companion safely into the town of Upton. When they arrived, Tom took the lady to the best inn in the street and asked for a room upstairs. As they followed a servant up to the room, the landlord shouted, Hey, where is that beggar woman going? Come downstairs! Leave the lady alone, cried Tom from above. Then, leaving his companion in her room, he returned downstairs to ask the landlady to send her up some clothes. Now, the inn at which our travellers had arrived was very respectable. Good ladies from Ireland and the north of England liked to stay there on their way to Bath. While the landlady could not expect every conversation that took place under her roof to be perfectly innocent, she did not want the inn to get a bad name. Tom and his half-naked companion must go before they harmed her reputation. The landlady had picked up a heavy kitchen pot and was just about to go upstairs when Tom came in, asking for some clothes. As they stood there, the landlord arrived, calling the lady upstairs all the bad names he could think of. Tom hit the landlord. The landlady lifted her pot to hit Tom, and at this moment Partridge walked in, glad to find Tom again. Seeing the danger, Partridge caught hold of the landlady's arm. She turned and knocked him to the ground. The sound of a carriage and horses outside put a sudden stop to this bloody war. The landlord and his wife rushed out to meet the new guests. A young lady and her maid had arrived and were taken upstairs to the best room. Tom rushed to pick up faithful Partridge from the floor and sent him outside to wash his bloody nose at the water pump. Now the naked lady came down, asking about all the noise. She found a tablecloth to cover herself with. At this moment, a soldier arrived, demanding beer and somewhere to sleep. He noticed Tom's lady companion. Madam, said the soldier in surprise, are you not Captain Waters's lady? Have you had some kind of accident? I have indeed, said Mrs. Waters, and I have to thank this gentleman for rescuing me. Whatever this gentleman has done, my lady, said the soldier, I am sure the captain will thank him for it, and if I can help you, please command me. Hearing these words, the landlady now rushed into the kitchen, apologizing to Mrs. Waters for her behavior and offering her some clothes to wear. Oh, how could I know that a fashionable lady like you would appear in such rags, she cried. If I had suspected that my lady was my lady, I would have burned my tongue out before I said what I said. Tom begged Mrs. Waters to forgive the landlady and to accept her clothes, and the two women went upstairs. Partridge soon came back, the landlord brought in beer, and perfect calm returned to the kitchen. Chapter 13 An Inn's Reputation is Put at Risk Tom had not eaten for twenty-four hours. So when Mrs. Waters invited him to have dinner with her in her room, he was happy to accept. While three pounds of meat, which were once part of an animal, now became part of Tom, Mrs. Waters watched him with other things on her mind. Now, Tom was really one of the handsomest young men in the world. His face was the picture of health, with signs of sweetness and good nature which were noticed by everyone who saw him. He was strong, active, gentle, and good-tempered, and people enjoyed his cheerful company. Mrs. Waters saw all this, and formed a very good opinion of him. In fact, she had fallen in love with Tom, and she wanted him to know it. 
How could she show him? First, she shot sharp looks from her two lovely blue eyes. But these only hit a piece of meat, which Tom was then putting on his plate. Then a heavy sigh lifted her fair breasts, but its sweet sound was lost as he opened a bottle of beer. Many other tricks were tried, but while our hero was eating, hunger defended him against love. When dinner was over, the attack began again with a smile which showed more than just pretty white teeth. This smile our hero received with full force, and he began to see the enemy's plan. He defended himself weakly, trying to think about his fair Sophia, but his heart was soon captured by Mrs. Waters, and we will now politely leave the room. Meanwhile, the couple upstairs were the topic of conversation in the kitchen, where the landlord sat with his wife, Partridge, the soldier, and the carriage driver. The soldier explained that Mrs. Waters was the wife of a captain, though some people said they were not actually married. People also said she was a good friend of Mr. Norverton's, though the captain knew nothing about that. The soldier then asked where Partridge and his master were travelling. "'He's not my master,' said Partridge. "'We are friends. Amicum sumus. I am a schoolteacher, and he is one of the greatest gentlemen in the country.' "'Then why does such a great gentleman walk about the country on foot?' asked the landlord. "'I really don't know,' answered Partridge. "'He has a dozen horses and servants in Gloucester, but last night he decided to walk.' The soldier then began to drink to the king, and after a while he suggested a fight. The carriage driver agreed to fight for a bet, and the two took off their shirts and fought each other fiercely until the soldier won. The young lady, who had been resting upstairs, now sent down orders for her carriage to be prepared, as she was ready to continue her journey. Impossible. To speak plainly, the carriage driver was now completely drunk. So was the soldier. Partridge was not much better. The landlady was called to take tea upstairs to Mr. Jones and Mrs. Waters, and she told them this news. "'She is such a sweet, pretty lady,' she said, "'and in such a hurry to leave. "'I am sure she is in love and running away to meet a young gentleman.' At these words, Tom sighed heavily. Mrs. Waters noticed. She suspected she might have a rival, but she did not mind. Tom's beauty charmed her eyes, but because she could not see his heart— she did not worry about it. Nor did she bother to tell him about her own situation. Though Tom was careful not to ask her questions which might embarrass her, the reader will surely want to know. So here are the real facts. This lady had lived for some years with Captain Waters, pretending to be his wife and using his name. I am sorry to say she was also very friendly with Mr. Norverton— it was a friendship that did her reputation no good. When Norverton threw the bottle which hit Tom's head, he thought it had killed him. He escaped punishment by running off into the night, and it was to Mrs. Waters that he ran. Captain Waters was away at that time, so Mrs. Waters agreed to help Norverton to get away to a seaport where he could escape abroad. She offered to walk with him to a place where he could get a horse— and she said she would give him some of her money. Norverton noticed that she had ninety pounds in her purse and a diamond ring on her finger, and he made another plan. When they reached a lonely wood, he suddenly took off his belt, grabbed the poor woman, and tried to kill her. It was at this moment that our hero had arrived to rescue her. It was now midnight, and everyone was in bed except Susan, the kitchen maid, who was washing the kitchen floor. Suddenly, a gentleman on horseback arrived and rushed into the kitchen to ask if there was a lady in the inn. The late hour and his wild behaviour surprised Susan, but when the gentleman said he was looking for his wife, 
she immediately thought he was Mr. Waters. She accepted some money from the gentleman and took him upstairs to Mrs. Waters' room. In the polite world, a gentleman always knocks before he enters his wife's bedroom. This gentleman did knock, but in such a violent way that the door flew open and he fell into the room. As he got to his feet again, he saw, we admit it with shame and sorrow, our hero himself in bed, demanding to know the reason for this rude behaviour. The gentleman was about to apologise when he saw, in the moonlight, various pieces of a woman's clothing on the floor. In a jealous rage, he rushed to the bed. Tom jumped out of the bed to stop him. And now... Mrs. Waters, for we must confess she was in the same bed, began to scream. Murder! Robbery! Until the guest in the next room rushed in to help. This guest was an Irishman who was on his way to Bath. He stood at the door, holding a candle in one hand and his sword in the other. He looked at the furious gentleman and cried out, Mr. Fitzpatrick, what is the meaning of this? The gentleman immediately answered, Oh, Mr. McLaughlin, I am glad you are here. This devil is in bed with my wife. Your wife? cried Mr. McLaughlin. I know Mrs. Fitzpatrick very well, and I don't see her here. Fitzpatrick now looked more closely at the lady in the bed and saw his unfortunate mistake. He began to apologize. At that moment, the landlady came in, and Mrs. Waters quickly called out to her, "'What kind of place is this? All these men have broken into my room to rob me!' Fitzpatrick, hanging down his head, explained his mistake, apologised again, and left with his friend. Tom explained that he had rushed in to help Mrs. Waters when he heard all the noise. "'Thank God my reputation is not ruined!' cried the landlady. There has never been a robbery in my inn. Only good, honest people come here. And she returned downstairs. And what about Mr. Fitzpatrick? After he had disturbed the house in this unfortunate way, the reader will find it hard to believe he was a gentleman. Mr. Fitzpatrick was indeed born a gentleman, but without any money. Luckily, he had married a young woman with a fortune. He was cruel to his wife, but generous with her fortune. Now he had spent it all, and she had run away. Mr. Fitzpatrick had followed his wife, and was sure he would find her in the inn at Upton. After his terrible mistake, he never thought she might be in another room. Tired and disappointed, he accepted Mr. McLachlan's kind offer to share his bed for the rest of the night. Chapter 14 The Ring on His Pillow The landlady went downstairs to talk to Susan about the night's events, and Partridge, who was always looking for a chance to drink and talk, joined them in the kitchen. After a while, two new people arrived at the inn, two young women in riding clothes. One of them was so richly dressed that Partridge crept into a corner to admire her. The lady in the rich clothes asked if she could warm herself at the kitchen fire. She didn't want to eat, and said they could only stay an hour or two because they were in a hurry. The landlady sent Susan upstairs to light a fire in a bedroom where the lady could rest. When the lady was settled in the bedroom, her hungry maid came back downstairs to the kitchen and ordered a chicken. Now the chicken was still alive, and the maid was hungry. The landlady suggested other meat, but the maid was as delicate as a queen about her food. Indeed, she said, I believe this is the first time I have ever sat in a kitchen to eat. I am glad there are no poor people here. You, sir, look like a gentleman. Yes, yes, madam, cried Partridge. I am a gentleman. I am here with the son of great Mr. Allworthy of Somerset. I know Mr. Allworthy very well, said the maid, and I know that he has no son alive. This confused Partridge a little, but he answered, 
Well, madam, not everybody knows this, for Mr. Allworthy was never married to the mother, but Mr. Jones is certainly his son. You surprise me, sir, cried the maid. Mr. Jones is in this inn? And she rushed upstairs. Sophia, for this was the richly dressed young lady, was resting with her lovely head on her hand when her maid entered the room, crying, Madam, who do you think is here? Sophia sat up and cried, Not my father. No, madam, said Honour, the maid. It is Mr. Jones. Sophia sent Honour back to the kitchen to ask Mr. Jones's friend to wake him immediately. Partridge refused. My friend went to bed very late. I promise he will not be angry, Honour insisted. Another time, answered Partridge. One woman at a time is enough for any reasonable man. He then told Honour directly, for he was more than a little drunk, that Jones was in bed with another woman. When Honour told Sophia this, she did not believe it. At that moment, Susan came in to check the fire. Sophia asked her what she knew, and, with the help of some money from Sophia, the story came out. Then Susan said, If you like, madam, I can creep into the young man's room and see if he is in his own bed. Sophia agreed, so she did this, and came back to say that Tom's bed was empty. Then Susan said that Mr. Jones had told everybody about Sophia. He told us, madam, that you were dying of love for him, but he was going to the war to get rid of you. But how could he leave such a fine, rich, beautiful lady as you to be with another man's wife? Sophia sent Susan downstairs to order the horses. Then she burst into tears. After some time, she thought of a way to punish Tom. She gave Honour her favourite ring, and asked her to leave it on the pillow in Tom's empty room. She then paid her bill, and rode away with her maid. It was now past five in the morning. During the night, the other young lady, deciding not to wait for her carriage driver, had left the inn on horseback with her maid. Other people were now waking up. Tom returned to his room to get dressed and called Partridge. Oh, sir, cried Partridge, why should any man go to these Harida Bella, these bloody wars, when he can go home and have everything he needs? Partridge, you are a coward, cried Tom. You may go home if you wish, but I will not. Then I will stay, said Partridge, for you need me. Why, last night I protected you from two wicked women. And see, one of them was in your room, for there is her ring. Oh, heavens, it is Sophia's, cried Tom. Is she here? She was, sir, said a frightened partridge. But by now she will be many miles away. Then we will leave immediately, cried Tom. Downstairs. Mr. Fitzpatrick and his friend, Mr. McLaughlin, were making arrangements for a carriage to take them to Bath. At that moment, shouting loudly, a man arrived on horseback with several companions. It was Sophia's father. Mr. Weston was asking loud questions about his daughter when Tom came downstairs with Sophia's ring in his hand. My daughter's ring, shouted Weston. Where is she? It is her ring, said Tom, but I have not seen her. He is a liar, cried Mr. Fitzpatrick, for I caught him in bed with her, and, sir, I'll take you to her room. Mr. Weston and Mr. Fitzpatrick rushed up the stairs together, and once again Mrs. Waters was disturbed by men bursting into her room. Mr. Weston was shocked apologized and rushed off to look for Sophia in the other rooms. Mrs. Waters now got dressed and prepared to leave. When it was clear that there were no young ladies in the inn, Mr. Weston cursed everybody, ordered his horses, and rode off with his companions. Mr. Fitzpatrick invited Mrs. Waters to travel to Bath in his carriage. Tom paid his bill and set off on foot with Mr. Partridge.